onto the test. If you didn't take last odd, the chapter one test, this is the way it works. I've got five slides, they're question slides, and I'm going to put them up for about five to ten seconds each, and you can pause it on YouTube or whatever video channel you're looking at, pause it, and try the question, and then at the end, I'm going to go over each of the questions in order. Okay, so good luck on the test, and I'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. I hope the test was, uh, was good for you. I hope it was good. Um, let's go over the five questions, shall we? Okay, so the first question I started you off with was a very easy one. I asked you, what does the squeeze theorem say? Well, if you remember the squeeze theorem, squeeze theorem, it was a very simple theorem that said, let's assume that f of x is less than g or equal to g of x, which is less than or equal to h of x near, but not necessarily at, necessarily at a point a. Now, if the limit, if this is true, if the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to the limit as x approaches a of h of x, and that limit exists and is a number, let's call it L, what the squeeze theorem says is that therefore, or then, it follows, hold on, it follows such that the limit as x approaches a of g of x is also going to be L. And we represented that graphically, as you remember, we had two functions, three functions near a point A, and the one on top, the one on the bottom, were heading towards the same number, and there's one in between them, squeezed in between them. It was also going towards that number. So that's the squeeze theorem, aptly named. All right, so that was the first question. Now the second question was a true or false? If P is a polynomial, then the limit as X approaches B, P of X equals P of B. That's true. If you remember when we talked about limits of polynomials, this was in fact a theorem. The limit as X approaches B of P of X, just got really dark in here, wow. P of X equals P of B. It's probably getting ready to storm. That's the, can you see? Hold on a second. I'm going to have to use light. Okay. P of X equals P of B. Now, what this means is that we can take, let's take the function. Um, I made one up here. X squared plus 3X plus 6. The limit as X approaches 4, let's say, is pretty easy to find. It's 4 squared plus 3 times 4 plus 6, 16 plus 12 plus 6, 16 plus 18 is 34. So that's the way that this works. And we find out that, in fact, P of 6, or P of B, is P of X. That's what it is. That's the way polynomials work. Now, moving right along, we've got question number three, where I ask you to find the limit as R approaches 9 of the function square root of R over the quantity R minus 9 to the fourth power. Okay, let's look at that really briefly if we can. We've got limit as r approaches 9 of square root r over r minus 9 to the fourth power. Now, if you were, if you were good, if you were good, you, you took some heart of all of my talking about rationalizing the numerator, and you thought about it, and you were, you were worried, you know, 
But then you'd think and you'd realize that direct substitution actually works in the numerator. It actually works. What we end up getting is not 0 over 0. We don't get 0 over 0 if we plug in 9. We get 3. We get the square root of 9 over 9 minus 9 to the fourth power. Well, that is nothing other than 3 over 0 to the fourth power. So what happens as it gets really close to 9? Well, we get a massive number. We get a massive, massive number. So, in other words, we get infinity. And that is, that's the answer. The limit doesn't exist. It's not a real limit. So you didn't even need to rationalize the numerator there. It wouldn't have had any effect one way or the other. All right. Now, for the fourth question, we're going to use the intermediate value theorem. Use the intermediate value theorem to show that there is a root of the equation, of the equation in the given interval. And the equation was 2x cubed plus x squared plus 2 equals 0 on the open interval, negative 2 to negative 1. Now, if you remember, finding a root of an equation is the same as finding a 0. It's called finding a 0 in algebra or pre-calculus, or at least at mine it was called that. Um, and what we're going to do here is we're going to say, okay, well, let's use the intermediate value theorem. First, we need a function, a good idea, since it's set to zero and we need to find out that there is a zero, let's choose f of x to just be that. f of x equals 2x cubed plus x squared plus 2. Okay? So that's our f of x. Now, the intermediate value theorem says that between one number and the other number, if there's another number in between that interval, that at some point the function passed that. Let's draw this graphically again to remind you. We have two points, point A and point B. We have f of A and f of B. Okay? Boom, boom. What that says is that if this is continuous the whole way, then at some point, at some point, you can find a C. You can pick any... Uh, you can pick any number in between f of a and f of b. Any number. Anywhere. And there is a point in this function where c equals that number. Pick another number here. c. Very, very useful. Very useful for our theory. So, now what we're going to do is we're going to examine it. Let's, uh, we have an interval, negative 2 and negative 1, so let's solve it f of negative 2 equals 2 times negative 2 cubed plus negative 2 squared plus 2. Well, we carry out the arithmetic there. We see that that's negative 16 plus 4 plus 2 is negative 10, which is obviously less than 0. Now we take f of negative 1, and we get 2 times negative 1 cubed plus negative 1 squared plus 2. And if we carry out the arithmetic, we'll see that that is 1, which is greater than 0. So follow me here. We've got negative 10 is this. We've got 1 at that point. Well, that means that graphically, somewhere on this function, for example, if it was negative 10 down here, and 1 is here, if at a it was, or if at negative 2, negative 2, negative 1, if at negative 2 it was negative 10, and if at negative 1 it was 1, then I don't know what the graph was doing in between, but at some point, it had to have crossed the x-axis, which proves, through the intermediate value theorem, that there is indeed a root of the equation. Okay? Now, for the last question. This is a very...
very appropriate question, especially for me, because in two years, I'm going to have to deal with this. And maybe you will too. And that's not really that good. And that is the cost of repaying a student loan at an interest rate of R percent per year is C equals F of R. Three part question here. What is the meaning of the derivative F prime R and what are the units? B, what does the statement F prime 10 equal 1200 mean? And C, is F prime R always positive or does it change sign? Well, we have the cost of repaying a student loan, C, and an interest rate per year, C equals the cost is a function of the rate. So what that means is that the derivative is a cost, yeah, the derivative of F, um, the, the derivative F prime R is just the change of cost, D dx, or D dx, change of cost, with a given with respect to a certain interest rate. So as the uh, interest rate changes, how does the cost change? That's what, that's what the derivative is saying. And the units are going to be dollars over percentage per year. because the interest rate is R percent per year, cost is dollars. That's why we have, remember, rise over run. It's all there, it's all there. So that's the first part. The second part is what does the statement F prime 10 equal 1200 mean? Well, if you didn't get the first part, you probably didn't get the second, but if you got the first, I bet you got the second. That means that the rate, if C equals F of R, and R is the interest rate percentage per year, well then that means that the rate is 10%, 10% per year. And 1200 is the cost increase. So that means that the cost increased $1,200 by a 10% per year rate, okay? And the last part of the question is, is F of R, or F prime R, always positive or does it change sign? Well, you can easily see that it is always positive because as the rate increases, so does the cost. The rate goes up, so does the cost. So it is indeed always positive. And we'll talk more about that when we go over increasing and decreasing functions. So go ahead and add up your score a little bit in your head. I don't know how you want to assign partial credit, but I'll just put it to you like this. If you give each question 10 points, okay, and you give yourself 5 points for a partially correct answer and 10 points for a correct answer, you should probably have at least 30 points, maybe 35. If you've got 50, you're awesome. Anywhere between 40 and 50, you're very good. Between 30 and 40, you should be fine. Less than 30, if you missed, if you missed like two questions flat out or more, or you only got like half of each question, you might want to spend a little bit more time looking at limits, figuring out limits, figuring out what a derivative is, before we go to the next one, which is an article, which is a chapter on differentiation called Differentiation Rules. I'm so lame, but okay. That's basically what's going on. Thanks for finishing chapter two. We're a third of the way through calculus and, or calc one, and I'll see you next time when we usher in chapter three. Till then, I'm Augie Kennedy, and thanks for joining Super Awesome Calculus. Take care, y'all.